is my ultimate pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here today for this expert hour on behalf of the fourth floor. Today's topic, a hot one, um, how to best prepare yourself when pitching to male investors. Um, we will be, do, we'll be doing our best to allocate time at the end to, of today's discussion for questions from the audience. Please put a Q with a colon in front so it's easy for us to flag. And as Lauren said, she would also be looking for questions during the, during the hour, but happy to answer them at the end for sure. Um, before we dive in, a very brief word about the fourth floor. Um, we are a market network designed to diversify boardrooms and cap tables on a mission to close the gender, power, wealth, and funding gap by advancing for-profit board careers for women, supporting women-led uh, startups and fund, and providing women opportunities to invest in other women. So if you're not a member yet, Founders, you can join us to build out your boards with expert advisors in our board seat exchange and seek funding in our private investment club called The Back Room. If you are someone interested in advancing your board career or investing in a women-led startup or fund, you can join us as a board candidate or an investor. So please check us out. Um, we have upcoming platform tours. We will be putting the links in the chat. And we also have a board boot camp coming up on December 7th, where we talk about how to best build out boards and um, grow your board careers. So join us. Um, so enough about us. Uh, let's get to the point of today. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Lauren Kane to the spotlight. Lauren helps women founders who are looking for investor dollars to accelerate momentum in their business, but don't know where to start, don't know the resources available to them, or how to pitch to people in the room. So Speaking up, I will now turn the stage over to Lauren to introduce herself and address some of those awkward questions we get as women founders and how we can turn them around into a position of strength. Hi, Lauren. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much, Kat. I'm so excited to be here and talk about pitching to male investors with all of you. I see some familiar faces um, as I'm looking at the thumbnail. Welcome, welcome, welcome um, to those that I know and to those that I don't not yet know because I know that I will We'll get to know each other over this hour. Um, as Kat mentioned, I will try and watch the chat as much as I can. I will be sharing my screen, um, but I'll try and keep my eye on the chat to make sure that I'm answering questions as we go along. Um, but there will also be plenty of time at the end to talk about questions. Um, and I'm going to, with that said, I'm gonna start sharing my screen so we can jump and get into it. And I will tell you um, in a moment about me there we go. Okay, I think you guys can see that. Hopefully that looks good. Um, always fun playing the share screen game to make sure that it works. Um, so we are talking about today pitching to male investors and coming from a place of if you are a woman <laughs> pitching to male investors, not as men pitching to male investors, totally a different thing. Uh, so who am I and why am I here today? Um, so I am Lauren Kane, and uh, I have been in this space for over 10 years. I started as director of operations for a, a angel group, uh, VC fund, Golden Seeds. And I was there for six years and really became passionate about working with female founders. And I left there and, you know, really wanted to continue my journey supporting female founders. So I launched a company called VC Worthy Business. And what I do is I work with female founders solely on their uh, capital raise. Um, and so it is around your planning, your investor strategy, your pitch strategy, and then your execution around all of that. And I came to that as really watching the struggles and the differences that women go through when they're raising capital compared to men. So if you want to learn more about me, including my LinkedIn link and my website and all that kind of stuff, if you want to grab your phone and scan that QR code or take a screenshot, that'll take you to everything about me um, so that you don't have to listen to me rattle off a whole bunch of things. Um, but you can also find me on the fourth floor. I am a very proud fourth floor member. Um, I will say, you know, and I've said this before, um, fourth floor has the, the community there has truly transformed my business. I've been a member since the fourth floor launched, um, I, I, two years ago, maybe. Um, and so it has been uh, amazing to be able to support them and, you know, watch and witness what they are doing for women business owners. I mean, we need all the help that we can get. So, um, and I just want to point out that this picture I put here, because I'm pretty sure the person who took it, uh, 
put abs on me. And I just want to point out that those are not abs. Um, those are not my abs, at least, but I just wanted to point out in this picture that it looks like I do have abs and I'm really happy about that. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Okay, so what are we talking about today? Well, we already talked about me. Um, we're going to talk about some female founder stats. And then we're going to talk about how to be different. And this is all around talking to, to male investors, as well as you know, you can take some of it and use it for when talking to female investors and then how to plan for success in your raise. And then we're going to dive into some questions that male investors ask. Um, and then I will have a question for you at the end. So I wanted to quickly remind you all how amazing female founders are. We do not talk about this enough. And I think that that is one thing that male investors or investors in general tend to forget is that female founders are actually rock stars. And so if you look at female founders versus their male counterparts had a 35% higher return than their male counterparts. Like that's awesome. That's amazing. And 63% of startups with at least one female founder that received investor capital um, outperformed by 63% their male counterparts. I mean, can we just like we talk about that? That is amazing. And uh, for those that, that went the crowdfunding rate or road or thinking about it, know that women have a success rate of 69.5% on crowdfunding campaigns. So women are pretty amazing. And what this tells me is that we can do it, right? That we can totally, can totally do it. And it is about showing others what we already know about you is that you can get the job done. Um, and I'm gonna quickly just bear with me. This might come in front of my screen. If it did, um, make sure that I open up the chat. Okay, so why do we have a harder time raising capital than men? First off, I always like to say I, I love men. Um, I do support female founders, but I have a husband and a son and a brother and I love men. Um, but inherently, we have a harder time raising capital because, you know, it is meant for men. It was created by white men for white men. It is, it is a system that was created by men years and years ago. It, it, right. We're not the good old boys. Exactly. And so what we're trying to do when we came into this system was to mold ourselves to the system and try and live in the system. But we are very different than men. We do things differently than men. We come to things differently than men, which those statistics prove that we do things differently, right? Because our numbers are different. If we did it the same, our numbers would be the same. Our numbers are actually better. So that tells me that we do things better and differently. So how can you raise capital in a world that's a male, not make, sorry, <laughs> I always have one typo. In a male dominated world, how can you raise capital in a world that is dominated by men? So anyone that knows me and there are people on here that, that have worked with me before or know me, know my thing is you have to raise capital your way and we're gonna build on this. So um, stay with me. And what I mean by raising capital your way is that you cannot raise it like all of the men before you, right? You can and, and around you, right? I, I hear all the time, I was in an accelerator and I was, you know, one out of three female founders in an accelerator of 12 and all of the dudes got money before the accelerator was over and here are the three females sit and we've got nothing. And I hear that so often. Well, it's because the accelerator was a system created to assist men, right? Unless you're in a female centric accelerator, but they're doing, they're, they're, they're going back to the good old boys club and they're teaching you how to raise capital the way that Google is going to teach you how to raise capital, the way that, you know, if you go in and look up how to do this, it's going to tell you to do this step and this step and this step. But really what you should be doing is thinking about what is your way of doing things. And I know that can be hard, right? When you're coming into the venture capital space or the fundraising space, you might not know all the things that you don't know. And it feels different. We have a different language. We have a different things, way of doing things. Some of the things that we do do not make sense <laughs> and can be frustrating and hard to grasp. 
And so our confidence starts to weaken a little bit, right? We were like, okay, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm beholden to, you know, any investor that'll take a conversation with me because they'll help me learn. Or, you know, maybe they'll invest in me if I just have a really good 45 minutes with them. But what you really need to think about is how do you want to do this your way? When you started your business, you had an idea that was disruptive. You wanted to do something different than the status quo. You looked at either something that was a system that was broken and saw a space and decided to fill it with your solution. Or maybe you're doing something completely new that has not been done before. You need to look at raising capital through that same lens. And so how do you want to raise capital? How do you want to be disruptive with your capital raise? Some of the things around that is, you know, what does your system look like? You know, what process are you going to take investors through when you are raising capital? What is the start date to your raise? What is the anticipated end date? What are the terms that you are looking for in your raise? What is non-negotiable for you? Like sit and there and think about what is non-negotiable for you and where you might be willing to bend. And ask yourself these questions before you go into raising capital, because it all comes back to, if you have answers to some of these questions, you can start to stand in a place of power. You can start to stand in a place of confidence. And even figuring out some questions, answers to some questions like, you know, how much are you raising? What would, what is your valuation cap going to be? Or what type of, you know, are you using a safe or a convertible note? Or, um, you know, are you doing an equity round? What would you value your company at? Even though you have a valuation cap, what would you value your company at? What are your numbers? Like knowing some of these things, while like even a valuation cap or a valuation is negotiable, if you have an idea in your head of what you, what is the lowest valuation cap you're willing to go? What is, you know, what is the, the, the lowest valuation you're willing to go on an a, a equity raise? Like knowing the, the, the information on that and knowing what, where that affects you and your company, if you make certain decisions, that is super helpful. Um, let's see. Sadly, we were told how to raise per, so we're going to talk about that in a second. I'm going to get to that, Miriam. Um, and, I, and I totally get what you're saying. Um, and VCs do have systems in, in place, but you can also uh, you can also circumvent some of those systems, right? You don't necessarily have to come at it exactly how they tell you to come at it. So let's get to that. So, and this is where we're going to spend a lot of, of time here. So I want you to, to plan for success in your race. So we talked a little about knowing your numbers and your facts, right? You need to know your numbers and your facts because you need to be able to have that self-confidence. Everything goes with the self-confidence. If you don't, so number one, if you don't believe in the information that you are talking about, an investor is not going to believe you. So all roads lead back to self-confidence. And I will give you an example. Say you went into order a sandwich and you said, is this sandwich good? And the person that you're ordering from went, well, I think it might be. And I think we can make it exactly how you, you know, we said we were going to make it, but I'm not sure until we actually attempt to make it. Um, but, you know, if, if you want to order it, I, we'll try. And uses words like maybe, and I think, and words that are not concrete, not confident. I don't know that you would order that sandwich, right? You probably say like, no, I, 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 that doesn't, I'm not hearing anything that is enticing me. But if that person tells you that is the most mouthwatering sandwich that they have ever had, and that if you take one bite of it, you're gonna tell all your friends, you now wanna taste the sandwich. So you've got to come to your company like a sandwich, but not the same thing. Um, maybe bad example of a sandwich. Um, I might be hungry, but you need to come to it with confidence. Whenever, and it's not just pitching, it is having conversations with investors. You need to come with confidence. And a lot of times knowing your numbers and facts around your business leads to confidence. 
And if you don't feel like you can talk about your numbers or, or there's any part of conversation that you're going to have with an investor, you're like, oh my God, they asked me that one question, dear Lord, I'm going to die. Then have someone with you in that you know, conversation that can talk about it. So have someone with you. If you can't talk about your numbers, have your outsourced CFO come in and talk to the numbers, right? And confidently hand over the conversation to them. I want you to brag about yourself. This is a thing that men do not typically care or think another thing about singing their praises. But women, we tend to undersell ourselves and undersell our accomplishments. But investors want to hear that brag and not saying I'm the most amazing person in the world. It's saying with confidence, I did these things. I am, you know, you portray, I am awesome. You should invest in me. Like we've done all of this. And a lot of times I hear from women, but I'm not exactly where I thought I was going to be today. Like I thought I was going to be further along. They don't know that. They don't know that you were going to be further along, right? They, they don't know that, you know, where we sit on, where you're sitting on November 1st is where you wanted to be, is not where you wanted to be sitting on November 1st, right? They don't know that maybe you had your revenue to be double or revenue at all, right? They don't know that. So with confidence, brag about what you've accomplished up until this point versus feeling like you don't have enough. So the next thing is tell them how this thing will go. And this is where I want to get back to Miriam, your, your, your sentence. If you can show them, and, and it's not about saying this, 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 but if you can show them the next step in each step of your process in raising capital, then you're leading them along and down the path towards closing. What do I mean by this? Well, so if you're having a conversation with an investor, you open the conversation with this is the agenda of our call. So this is how I, how I typically run conversations with investors. We're going, I'm going to, I would love to hear more about you. Tell me all the things about you. Love to get to know you. And then I'll tell you a little bit about me and my company. And then I think we'll have enough time if you have any questions for me. They know, and we can talk about, you can even leave it with, and then we'll end it with what's next. So you're going to tell them at the end what's next. And at the end, you get to decide what's next, right? Do you keep the conversation going or do you move them to the next step? So you run the meeting, you run the agenda versus the other way around. And investors typically come to calls thinking like, okay, this is going to be exactly the same. They're going to ask me for money. They're not going to, you know, they're going to tell me about their company. They're going to go right into their pitch. Not a lot of times do we ask them about them. And I'm not saying like, ask them about them, you know, as an investor and, you know, you should do some of that, but ask them deeper questions like, you know, their family life, what they like to do for fun. Uh, you know, what are, what, what, what is a good movie that they saw recently? Some things that are different that other people aren't asking them. Cause while you've done a million investor calls, potentially they've also done a million founder calls. So you need to think about how can you be different from the other founders that they've, they've talked to and show up with confidence, right? And think about how do you want to lead that call? And then what is the next step? And you need to tell them. So, oh, and I love that. It's a relationship. I don't need everyone's money. I want and need great partners. That is a hundred percent true, Bridget. I love that. You need partners, right? And so that is where you decide the next step, right? Do you actually want to continue the conversation with this person? Just because they're an investor does not mean that you need their money, right? No, not all money is created equal when it comes to investors. Not all money is good. That is so true. And I have seen founders take money that has negatively impacted their company. And, and I tell founders all the time, if you have a gut instinct that something's off, follow it, trust it. And, you know, that money could be to the detriment of your company. And I've seen companies that have gone under because they've taken the wrong money because they're coming from a place of desperation versus confidence. And so there is a difference. 
And just because you're in a place where you're like, I need money yesterday. Would someone just give me money? And I get that. Like you're, you're like, this is it. I need the money. And this person, I, I, you know, if I just get $50,000, I can make it to the next month and continue my raise. Oh, and this person will give me $50,000. I don't care about the terms, but you have to, you have to care. Now, if you're doing a pre-seed or seed raise, you have to care now what happens now, because it impacts you so much. If you take money just for taking money's sake, you might walk away with nothing after giving years of your life to this company. And that would be such a shame. How long should a company have a pre-seed funding round open? Um, let's come back to that question. I will, I will answer that um, in a minute. I just want to make sure that we wrap this one up, but I will definitely come back. Um, Angela, I'll get back to you. So, okay. So you decide how the, uh, the agenda for the call, what that's going to look like, how you would like to lead that. You then tell them the next step. You decide, do they go to the next step or do you just say thank you and you move on? The next step could be that you take them into due diligence. Don't just send them the link to your data room, get them on a call and walk them through your data room, right? Things that you can do that will hopefully lessen the chance of them sitting on what I like to call that ledge where they will like, do I say yes or no? Never going to make a decision. You're going to constantly wonder if I'm going to invest in you. Get them off the ledge. And you've got to do it with confidence, right? And so it all goes back to confidence. Everything goes back to confidence. There is a theme here. It is confidence. And even if you don't feel like you have it yet, my number one thing is to focus on that inner CEO version of yourself. Think about yourself a year, three years, or five years from now, what does she look like? How would she carry herself? I can tell you when you become that badass CEO that you all are, I know you are, I can already tell. If you can channel her today in this moment, it will change everything. It will change everything. So one of the big things and we're talking about male investors, and this is going to kind of be the, the fun part before we get to the Q&A, is um, the redirecting bias. So we can't talk about pitching to male investors and not talk about the inherent bias. And I will also say it's not always male investors. The reason it's not always male investors and it's women is, well, I think two reasons. The first one is if it's a woman that was raised in, in the VC world with men as her mentor, she was inherently taught how to ask questions with a bias towards women. I don't think that that's how she intended it. I'm hoping that's not how she intended it, but that's what she's witnessed and she's mirroring. The other thing is that there tends to sometimes in anything we do be people like we talked about not taking money from investors that are red flags. But also, you know, there are sometimes mean girls out there. Like I was bullied growing up. I was bullied for years, years and years, elementary school and middle school. I was hardcore bullied. So I can spot it a million miles away. And sometimes those mean girls don't always go away. They exist everywhere in life, right? It is part of being an adult. I, we all deal with it, right? And so it's identifying those. And those are also investors that you don't have to say yes to. Don't, you don't necessarily have to say yes to a female investor because she's a female and you want a woman on your cap table. You want partners, right? You want the people that are going to make your company better. But if you get those that, you know, they're not mean girls and they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're male investors that seem to be who your ideal investor is. And they're asking questions in a way that, shows they have a little bit of bias, you can redirect, right? And that also goes back to comp. So let's go through a exercise that I like to say, call stupid and questions investors ask. Stupid questions investors ask, yay. Um, and um, Allison, I saw Allison was in here. Um, if uh, Allison would like to, uh, if you wanna put in chat, Allison, if you wanna come up with any, any of the questions and chat with me, um, Allison helps female founders um, and founders in general. <laughs> Hi, Allison. Um, 
if you would like to join in this, um, she helps them with their pitches. So um, please feel free to, to let me know if you want to join. So uh, you might get a question like this. And if you get any questions, you know, that you don't see up here, please feel free to put them in the chat and then we can, we can have some fun at the end. So how do you plan to compete in a crowded market? So how do you plan to compete in a crowded market, which is a negative, right? It is a going negative versus going positive. So we're going to play a game of, um, you know, how to redirect the question. And you don't have to always say, you know, I'm going to redirect your question. You don't have to say it outright, but you could say, uh, did you, I, I think you meant how much faster than the market can we grow? So you change the question, you reframe it, and then you answer. So, you know, I, I think what you're asking is how much faster than the market can we grow? Let me tell you more about that and answer the question, right? So you're immediately reframing it for them. And yes, I think a better question might be is also a great one, right? So let's see. How are you going to retain customers? I think a better question might be, how many more customers can we acquire? Right? Our platform, our, our, you know, our beta has the ability to expand to, you know, 100,000 users, right? So it's not about, you know, focusing on the customers that you have to, of course, you're going to retain your customers. I mean, and you might have, might have already talked about you know, your retention figures, you know, and, and how many uh, naturally fall off the, the system. Okay, but I mean, let's talk about how many more customers the system can handle. <laughs> Are you planning to have children? This one kills me. Um, I mean, the real question is how committed to the company is the founder? Right, like that's really what, none of your business. Yes, that is really what we all wanna say, right? None of your business, none of your business. But the reality of it is women get asked that question. And this is actually one that I find women get asked by women too, um, but it, you know, it happens. Um, and it, it, it's, I understand, I always try to see both sides, right? So like, I, I try to see why that might be happening and pull it apart. I understand why they might be thinking that, but here's the thing. If this were a corporate world and they asked you that question, they would get fired. <laughs> they cannot ask that question. You cannot ask a woman if she's planning on having a family or if she's pregnant or how she's gonna handle having, you know, being a mom and running a company. But at the, at the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, whether it's in corporate America or here, you know, how committed am I to what I'm doing? And it is, you know, I am committed to take this company through until exit. And they might even be trying to gauge, are you thinking about exiting this company at some point, right? Like, you know, women, we just have pet projects um, and side hustles. Right. And sometimes they think that, you know, we, we might never want to give this up. We want to keep it forever. So it's really how committed am I to get this to an exit? I want to see this through until the end. I want us all to, you know, pop bottles and celebrate how much money we all made. Do you need a male CEO? I don't really have a redirect for this one. That's just the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. Um, it, it is, this question is real, um, you know, uh, or have you thought about bringing on a male co-founder, right? Or even a co-founder in general. Um, it's just, there's no, it's no, no. Um, it's no, I have not thought about it because it's not anything in my, in my <laughs> world. Um, oh, you get that all the time. Interesting. Are you a tech company is what I want to ask if you get that. Um, so could you throw back and ask why? Um, yes, I see. I totally could guess what type of company or in your tech that you got that. Um, could you throw it back and ask why? 
I don't recommend throwing it back and asking why. And here is why I say that. You're going to end up going down a rabbit hole. And what you don't want to do with an investor is start a spiral or, or you know, um, a, a redirect that is not focused on your company. Because when you ask why, you are getting their opinion that you know you already don't agree with. So there's nothing that they're going to say that's going to be helpful to you in that setting. They've probably already made it clear that they don't, that they're not your investor. And so I would not keep the conversation going in that direction. I would, you know, end the call really, if they said that or end the meeting and say, thank you for your time and move on. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, uh, <laughs> um, you can still turn around by female. I, I, Allison, I love that. I love that. You could turn it around. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, and best of luck, uh, Allison's comment. So I'm going to read this female CEOs return more dollars invested. Um, well, let me just make sure I can see the whole chat. If you believe a male CEO is needed, we aren't going to be a good fit. And I feel sorry that you'll miss out on this great opportunity. Best of luck. Yes, Allison, that is, that is gold. Um, and that's just bringing it to a close. And then they understand that, that you're not going to continue this line of questioning anymore. You know, it really is not negotiable for you to have someone on your cap table that believes that you know, you need to have a, a man there. Um, okay, so I have one final question and this is directed at you guys and this is before we open it up for, for Q&A. What will be different for you? So now that we've talked through how you can come to this from a place of confidence and some things that you can do to build that confidence, what will be different for you when you're talking to male investors, any investor, what will be different for you? How are you gonna show up differently for yourself the next time that you talk to an investor? And it doesn't have to be a question that you answer right now. It's something I really want you to think about. And if you have a piece of paper and pen handy, I want you to write it down. Like what will be different for you? Have you asked yourself that question? recently? Did you know things could be different for you? And with that, I am going to stop sharing and open it up for questions because I know that you guys always have really great questions. So I try to leave a good amount of time. Um, and so if you have a question, if you could do me a favor and raise your hand, either say it in chat or raise your hand and um, we will open it up. I had a few previous questions that I had in chat that were okay. kind of about, it was kind of okay. about how long of a round and should that change or should, because we're female founders, be rigid in the expectation of, okay, men think that a round should be this long, but do we even have, to, is that a steadfast rule or just some arbitrary that we can push to our own needs? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really about what your needs are. Um, I think it's a great question. And, you know, what I would say is, you there might be times where you have to put your raise on hold. And first off, if you get, if you're fundraising and you get a couple checks in, so say you get, you know, you're raising a half million and you get $200,000 in, it's okay to say to yourself, okay, do I wanna take a month pause from raise and now that I have money, start to put this to work while I then go back out and raise. So first off, if you get money, get it in the bank. Get it in the bank as soon as humanly possible. Don't let it sit there because you do run the risk of losing it. You do run the risk of investors, you know, looking at shiny objects over here or, you know, doing whatever they do. And you don't want to lose them when you feel like you have everyone together. So you don't have to raise and close everything at the same time. It can be in staggered uh, tranches, staggered closings. Um, so you can also gauge if you raise a certain amount, what is your minimum that you want to raise for this round? And if you can get that close, take a moment, build some traction and come back. You can also take stock after you've closed and a couple, you know, couple investors and say, do I want to continue with this or is this enough? 
And if you can make the case for your, you know, if your investors ask you, if this is enough, if you can, if you can actually do what you want and what you set out and said you were going to accomplish with this amount of money, then go, go and do it. Maybe you're like, I'm going to hit pause for a month and I'm going to get my traction a little bit more. You know, I'm going to get another data point. I'm going to get some more users on the platform. I'm going to, you know, add that piece to our e-commerce website, or I'm going to add, you know, five more SKUs, whatever it might be. So that when you go back out, you feel like you have a little bit more information to give investors. You might also decide if like, if you're doing a save, maybe because you're at a different point, your terms are different. So you can decide there is no hard and fast rule. I would say if you're doing a pre-seed, it depends on how much you're raising six months to a year. If, if you're, if it's not, you know, if it depends on how, where your company is, what type of company, you know, where you are in your company, if you're pre-revenue, pre-product, it's going to take a little bit longer. That is a heavy lift. And so, you know, you need to give yourself that space and time. It's not something, you know, when I say like set your dates, it's not about, okay, I am going to open my race tomorrow and I'm going to give it 30 days and then I'm done. And I've never done this before and I have no revenue and I'm just going to get this done. And I said, I'm going to do it. Maybe you can. I've seen stranger things happen, but if you're raising $5 million and we do it in 30 days, I don't think that's going to happen. Set realistic expectations for yourself. One, so you don't let yourself down, right? Like that kind of sucks when you've, you know, said you're going to do something and then it doesn't turn out that you can do it the way that you want to, you don't want to do that to yourself. So set realistic expectations for what you think is doable. And also remember that you have to run your business. And so it's not about raising, becoming full-time. It's about you raising a little bit of the time in your day. And then the rest of the time is blowing up your company and making it better and bigger and bolder for investors to take notice of. And so running your company is your number one priority, not spending all day long on chasing investors because you will, you will chase your tail if you do that. So Angela, did I answer that question for you? Okay, Other than, tell me more. Uh, there's wonderful questions out there. I'd like to hear the answers okay. to others, please. Okay. Um, if I don't get to the rest of your question, if I didn't answer it enough, you can come back at the end or put it in the chat. Um, Deborah. Yeah. Hi, thanks for taking my question, Lauren. So this has to do with introductions to investors. So I've been reading that it's better to get an introduction, a warm introduction from somebody that you know and that they know rather than doing a cold call. So I went through my I created a list of all of the appropriate people that I thought I would want to get investments from. And then I tried to track down uh, people that might have connections with them for the referrals. A hundred percent of these connections that I thought might also know them were people in a, a related industry to me, people that I'm in a networking group and they were all men. And what by and large seemed to be happening, what is that those men, when I would want to engage in a conversation about, let me share more about what I'm doing to help see if this is the right fit, this person, how we might talk to them. They didn't want to engage with me and talk about that at all. They just wanted to go straight to their investor, put something in front of them that I had provided. And then I, I would get back a no, like, no, she's not ready. No, we don't want to talk to you or no response at all. And that could just be where I was at in my fundraising, but there was such a pattern going on. Uh, even one of the guys who I knew very well insisted on getting paid for the job. And so I'm wondering if this is common across men and women when they're trying to get introductions, being paid, not having the right conversations before they go in and talk to the person, or if there's something else that I can do to better uh, make sure that those referrals happen. So the conversations you were having with your connections in advance, were they through email or were you doing it over Zoom ahead of time? Yeah, so in, some, in most of those cases, I had previously met the person by Zoom because we were in the same network group in the similar industry. And so we'd already introduced ourselves, talked about what we do. And so the introduction, uh, request for introduction was by email along with my executive summary that I had created at that time. Okay. Um, so there's two things that you can do. Um, the first is you can have a 
template introduction email that they can copy and paste. And you can give them the option. They don't have to use that, but it, that you highly recommend because it allows you to see how they're positioning you. Like you want to be positioned the way that you want to be positioned. It allows you to control that narrative yeah. if you are giving them the data points, right? And, mm -hmm. and also it makes it really easy. Like, I don't know about you, but when I do introductions email, introductory emails, I spend time on them a lot of time. And so you want to make it easy for someone to do that. And if they can just hit copy and paste, awesome. And then you don't have to necessarily worry, like, what did they say? Did they say the right, right thing? And usually, even if they're in your industry, they probably don't know exactly what you're doing, especially if you're doing something that's, you know, something that other people have, are not doing yet. Yes. So they might not get it, right? Um, and they might not get the, the, the magnitude of that. The other thing is, it's always helpful when you're asking for introductions to possibly get that person on a Zoom call 10 or 15 minutes just for a quick catch up so that you can get their commitment on making the introductions verbally. And you know, you're know you further deepening and establishing that relationship. So just because you know each other through a networking group, you might need some more one-on-one -on -one time, mm -hmm. right? And so I would recommend also doing that. And then you can say to them, hey, I would like to, um, you know, I would like for you to make these intros. What do you feel about that? I see that you're, you know, you, you know, this person, this person, this person, if I send you this template, would you be able to forward this on? And you're getting their buy-in. If they're hesitant, you can sort of gauge that in the email and you can also, or in the call, you can also ask them who else might, you know, is there anyone else that comes to mind and tell them who you're looking for. I'm looking for an investor. That's this, 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 this. And it helps them think through who mm -hmm. they might know. Okay. And so you might actually walk away with more connections and who you're going in and asking them for. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Miriam. Yeah, hello. <clears throat> I wanted to address your point on bragging. Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, when I was in front of a panel of uh, potential investors for us, a whole bunch of men, just one woman, and uh, I gave the presentation and they said, love the story, love the pitch, loved everything. Uh, but then uh, one of the male investors said to me, you didn't brag about yourself. You didn't tell us, you know, like all the things that you've done in your life and what you've achieved. And we've seen your LinkedIn profile. And so we know that you've done many different things. You've been in different startups, et cetera. Uh, I found that very difficult to brag. You know, I, I was talking about, oh, we have these PhD scientists on our team and they've done this research and that article and all, but I didn't say anything about myself. And I, I don't know how to tackle that. I, I have made a note, but I, I, I wanted to ask, you know, about bragging about ourselves, that too, to a male panel. Uh, any thoughts? <laughs> um, well, how much time do we have? Um, it is a hard <laughs> thing to brag about ourselves. We undersell ourselves. We undersell ourselves. We undersell our accomplishment in our companies. Create a brag slide. I think that's great. <laughs> so, yes. Um, but thinking through what you might want to brag on can be a hard, hard thing, right? And so sometimes it's asking your friends and family around you, what would they say about you? And and ask them to reflect back. If you have professional friends, right? What, what would they say about you? Take a look at your LinkedIn and take a step back and say, okay, I'm not even gonna look at the, this is mine. This is someone outside of me. If I was gonna hire this person, why would I hire them? If I was gonna bring this person onto my company to run my company, why would I bring them on? And make the case to yourself about yourself. And put, definitely put it in a slide. Um, and you can put some bullet points. Like that's the one way that slides are super helpful in your pitch deck. They can force you to say things that you might forget or, you know, curiously omit uh, to say to investors. And one of those things can be about yourself. And especially if you are an expert in an industry where your company lies or a sector where your company lies, you need to position yourself as the person that is, you know, best suited to run your company and how your expertise is so aligned with your company. That is going to help put investors' minds at ease. 
And so, you know, you have to do this, but try to take, if you, it might be easier for you to take a step back from yourself and look at yourself, like kind of out of body experience versus sitting down and like, I'm going to just create a, you know, a slide about me and how awesome I am. You, you are going to hire yourself <laughs> and okay. tell yourself all the great things. Um, okay. Thank you. I'm going to, um, Kristen, I'm going to come back to you. I just want to answer some of the questions that we had in chat. Um, any tips, suggestions for identifying the right investors before reaching out? Yes. So it is truly about looking for your ideal investor and, you know, having a real conversation and charting out who is that person and get deep, like, down to what their values are and their mission and what drives them, you know, what they like to do for fun, where they vacation, you know, do they have a sense of humor? You know, it's not just about they invest in female founders at a pre-seed seed level. That is surface. You've got to go deeper. And it's not that you're necessarily going to be able to flush all of that out as you are, you know, in this process and looking at investors, like you're not necessarily going to see maybe unless you're stalking their Instagram where they like to vacation. However, um, if you know that they like to ski in your mind, like you're painting a picture of that person that they like to ski, um, you know, then maybe you see a picture of them skiing, you know, Jackson Hole, and you're like, okay, I, this is my person, right? Like there's little things that you can do. Look at the portfolio companies that they've invested in. Sometimes that can give you a, a window into what they're thinking. If they say they invest in female founders and you look at their portfolio and there's not one female founder, I'm thinking that they probably don't. Like if, if their you know, diversity is something that's super important to them and then they don't have a diverse portfolio, I'm thinking it's probably not. Or if you look at it on the flip side and you know, they, it's diversity all over the place, then you know this person might be worth having a conversation with. And so you've got to understand who you're really looking at. And it's so much deeper than just where you sit and what your company is. Um, okay. How would that influence the equity that they request for that amount? Um, Angela, you might have to give me more context. I think I, I wasn't sure where we were. Uh, oh, question. Okay. How would that influence the equity amount there? I'm, I'm guessing, is that a question from an investor or... Um, just give me a little bit more context, um, help my brain um, name drop a little bit on the team slide. Yep. Um, okay. I think that's so far. If I missed any in the chat, please let me know. Um, and Kristen, we'll come back to you. Your hand raised so nicely. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much for doing this. I think it was like the perfect timing for me and my co-founder. She's also on this call, Bridget. Um, we are about to start raising our seed round and I'm like a little, thank you. I'm a little <laughs> nervous because we're going into the holiday season and I'm like, is this a, an okay time to raise? Or are we going to just be like, nope, come back in January. And like, we don't want to wait because we, we have like, we have some momentum and we have like a lot of, a lot of like really good tests and results back from what we've been, been doing for the past 18 months. Um, but we, we really want to start raising now. So I'm just worried that we're, kind of doing it at a bad time because of, but because of the holiday. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the timing, if you feel like it's time, just do it, jump in. Um, what I would say is set your expectations because it is the holidays. So you're good until Thanksgiving and then the week of Thanksgiving, people will start to drop off for about two weeks. And then you have a couple weeks in December um, and then towards the end of December, around Christmas time, they'll drop off again until after New Year's. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be taking that time to talk to investors and, and, and putting yourself out there. It takes a minute to get into the groove of things. And so put yourself out there, start to have those conversations, start to put feelers out there, or use this time to do all the things that you need to have to, ready for your raise, like your pitch deck and your data room and your investor list so that when you're ready to, what's that? You got to, oh, well oh, then go for it's, it. It's ready. <laughs> Don't wait. Don't wait. Cause you know what? There's never a right or a wrong time. It is, you know, it, 
you can talk yourself in and out of <laughs> race at the right time, anytime. And so you just got to do it. You got to take the leap. And I would say like, use this as an, you know, use the time off around Thanksgiving and Christmas as an excuse to take some time off. I know crazy founders taking time off. What am I talking about? We don't do that over the holidays, but maybe you do. And, and you can use that time to take a step back and say, okay, we've been doing this for a couple of weeks. What's working? What's not working? So the things that are working, we're going to keep doing it. Maybe we do it even bigger and better. And the things that aren't working, can we tweak them? And so that it'll be a little bit different. And so it, it is a good time to take stock. Amazing. Um, Thank you. Do it. Do it. Do it. Thank you. <laughs> I will. I will. We will. Okay. okay. Awesome. Uh, Sarah. Hi. Thank you. Um, just find my video on. Here we go. Uh, so I had a question for you about establishing credibility. And obviously, you know, top of that list is your traction and you've got your team, your advisory board. Um, I put together things like video testimonials and referrals, but I was wondering if you have any other creative or unique suggestions for establishing credibility kind of along with rapport. Okay, so, so who you're establishing credibility for investors, what types of questions do you think that they would ask you that you need to establish your credibility for? Well, Tell me a more. lot of the conversations that I've had, the VC conversations are, are with men, you know, and I actually was invested in uh, by a VC and I was the first female CEO that they'd ever invested in. So I had a little win there, awesome. um, but I can think I continue to experience a lot of those questions that you brought up. And I've found that in, you know, quite a few of these situations, it helps to kind of disarm them with something unexpected or give them something, you know, unpredictable. And so that's why I was wondering if you've seen anybody put together, you know, unique presentations or, or come at, you know, come to a meeting with a different way of starting things um, or framing questions. Um, I guess that's my question. Yeah. I mean, anything that you can. So I think first off, if you are taking the lead on the call, mm -hmm. that immediately helps establish you as a leader. Mm -hmm. Right. So that immediately shows an investor your CEO skills, which they're looking for. They're looking for the ability for you to lead, even if it's just a team of you right now. But they want to feel that you're, you know, they're confident in you. And that starts with you being confident in your ability to lead. So it's not necessarily about you making the case of, you know, and you do need to make the case of why you are the person to to lead this company, but it's, it should not be about you having to feel like you need to defend it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Right. It's, I have this experience. I know my, my shit. And you know, like if you're like Mary, I'm like, I have that expertise. Right. And I'm not going to defend it. I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to sing my own praises for once. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not going to defend my expertise. Right. Um, you can always start your, you know, opening, especially if you're pitching, you can always start in a creative way. I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. And so I would do something around your company. Um, you can make them laugh and you can make them, you know, nervous. You can, un and uncomfortable, you can make them curious. You can, anything that evokes emotion will also help build connection. Yeah. The, so that, that emotion word is, is such a loaded one. I mean, you know, I've, I've pitched before and in the same group, I've gotten the feedback. Uh, oh, very clinical. And this seems like, you know, there isn't enough heart to this. And then at the same time, even though I've got PhDs and experts, et cetera, on the team and on the board, oh, cute team, maybe they need some more, you know, heavy hitters or professionals. So it's like, you can't be both of those people at the same time, but we get that. So it's kind of like, well, you know, I, I, I want to be my authentic self, but it, it's tough when you've got like, such a scope wide range in you know, how people are going to perceive you just because you're a woman. Here's the thing. If anyone says stuff like that to you and you know that you are a rock star, they're not your investor. Yeah. Like thank them for showing you that they're not the right fit. Right. Like thank them for making that abundantly clear right from the beginning and move on. It is not about if an investor gives you feedback. I always say like if an investor gives you feedback, 
if you made that change after they give you feedback, does that mean that they're going to turn around and invest in you? No, probably not. Right. And so don't, don't change the way that you're feeling you are doing your, your pitch or having a conversation where you're standing in authenticity. Don't change it. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, if you change it for someone else, then you're not in your authenticity. You've now changed. And what happens is you feel off and then future investors you talk to feel that offness. And they're like, what? I can't put my finger on why that conversation fell off. It just did. And they, then they're a no, they just write it off as a no. But really it's that you changed yourself so much to meet the expectations of all these investors that didn't invest in you, that you're no longer being in your truth. And that's really what it comes down to. If you guys know that you are amazing and that you have an amazing company and you know who your investors are, go out and get them and don't listen to anyone else who's not your investor. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. It's so easy for me to say, but it is hard stuff to do, but you know, put reminders for yourself. Like if you need to put a sticky on your computer before you talk to an investor that says, I believe in myself, I believe in me to remind you do that or whatever you need to do to remind yourself that you're awesome. Cause I mean, you are right. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Any other questions out there? I'm just checking the chat here. I think we got everything. Fundraising tweet. Oh my God. Allison. Awesome. I love that okay. graphic. Oh, it's so good. So good. Um, okay. I think that that's, that brings it to a close. I want to thank you all so, so much for having me and uh, sharing your time with me today. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to message me on LinkedIn or shoot me an email or, you know, an Instagram DM, all the things. Um, and I'd be happy to, to, you know, give you some time to support you. I believe in everything uh, you're building. Uh, oh. <laughs> she also believed as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lauren. This has been extremely useful, so helpful. And I think, you know, we address so many different topics and issues here. So I, I hope we're all walking away with the whole bag full of uh, new tips and tricks that'll get us those that investment. Um, so wonderful to have you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I did drop your website link into the chat. They said that uh, you said that they could connect with you on LinkedIn, but I also wanted to add that. And of course, um, I just want to say, yeah, thank you for all for coming and find each other on the on the fourth floor platform um, because we'll be posting this recording in the resources there for you to revisit at any time. And I will send out the recording to anybody who registered for the event. So I think that concludes. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful event. I love all the practical tips, Lauren. Oh, my favorite thing to do. <laughs> really, really great. They got to be practical. <laughs> yes, so good. Um, you know, even if you sometimes think that that they're uh, intuitive, it's just hearing them and reaffirming that that's the right way to go is so helpful. Especially when you're doing it, you know, a lot of times alone, you forget some things that just make sense. And you might not, you know, you might have normally remember, but when you're not talking to other people about this and it's hard because usually your ends aren't also raising capital. Um, it can be hard to, to remember some of the things that, you know, we just know. Yeah. And it's funny, I you probably didn't see it in the chat, but, you know, I was speaking to a VC the other day and I'm not, we're not even raising money, but she came right at me with those VC, those very like male dominated VC questions. I'm like, <laughs> so it, it's, it were, you know, I think it's not just for, it's for business in general. It's not just for investors to keep these principles, right. which is really helpful. Yeah.